before it. I don't see. Yes, it's right. Um, this is June 26, 1984, and this is the Oral History Project of the Newport Historical Society. I'm Emily Sherman, and my narrator is Patrick O'Neill Hayes. Uh, shall I call you Pat instead of Mr. Hayes yes. when I ask you yes. questions? Yes, please. Uh, the first question is, where were you born? I was born in Newport, Rhode Island. Would you like to tell me any of the s stories you've heard about your birth? No, I know I was born at home, and uh, the famous Dr. Sullivan was uh, the delivering doctor, I guess you call him, and uh, I was, uh, my home was at 22 Bateman Avenue, which is uh, a rather a well-known street in the lower part of the city southern part of the, of the city. Uh, that did, I, I suppose Dr. Sullivan uh, delivered some of your siblings? Of my siblings? And I don't know whether you and I use the word siblings. Your brothers uh, and sisters. My brothers and sisters uh, were probably, uh, at least uh, some of them were delivered by Dr. Sullivan, and, and maybe all of them. Uh, where were your parents born? My mother was born in Newport, and my father was born in Newport. Uh, I think, if you don't mind giving some dates, it will make the um, the history come out a little bit better. Uh, around what uh, generation were your parents? I don't have to have their birth dates, but I would like to know were they born in the... Um, my 90s. father was born in the uh, in the late 80s, and my mother was born in the early 90s. I would say that's the fair way. Of. And your own uh, era. My I was born on uh, January 7, 1918. That was a interesting time to be born, wasn't it? We'll, uh, we won't be able to get any World War I memories right. from you, no. except third hand or second hand. Um, what was your father's occupation? He was uh, mainly a golf professional. Did he ever change jobs? Well, he had been a club maker, um, a golf club maker in uh, Wanamaker's in New York um, in the early 1900s, I would say. And then he changed that job to become a professional in Newport, and after his retirement in, as a golf professional, uh, about World War II time, he uh, was working for the postal department in Newport. Well, now, did he leave Newport to go down to Wanamaker's as a young I think, clerk? I think he went there uh, in, during the winter times uh, of the early 20s and um, was making golf clubs. And also, I think he taught in a golf school down there. That was, uh, and he left the family? And the no, I didn't leave the family. I think that was before he was married. Okay. You got it a little wrong there. Well, if I, if I said that he was, I was born in 1918, he was probably in, at Wanamaker's early earlier. Than that. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And he also, was the owner of a, uh, a sporting goods store, which was uh, located on Franklin Street, and that w was something that he attended to more in the winter than in the summer, uh, because of the nature of his occupation as a golf professional. And I would say that he owned that from the late 20s to the mid 30s. I, I we will get to your golfing uh, uh, later on. Uh, did your mother work outside the home? No. I guess she had plenty to do on her own. Uh, was there help in the house? Mm, some, very little. Maybe, maybe somebody helping uh, washing clothes once in a while and cleaning once in a while, but no, no uh, built-in or uh, live-in help. And at that time, no grandparents or any other family? No. 
living just your uh, mother and father and the children alone. Um, did you tell me how many brothers and sisters you had? I had uh, three, three sisters and one brother. Older or younger? All younger. Aha. Uh -huh. So as the oldest in the house, you had some responsibilities, I'm sure. You don't think so? I don't think so, no. Well, that was a funny way to bring up a son. Uh, where did you start going to school? I started school in uh, St. Mary's kindergarten, I guess. And then maybe kindergarten at uh, Carey School and grammar school at Carey School. Uh, higher grammar school at John Clark and high school at De La Salle. And, uh, where did you go to college? Holy Cross in Worcester. So you got the Catholic education the whole way, the whole the whole like, way, except like, Carey School. Did that Carey give you school. they give you an outlook that was different? Uh, the Catholic school or the Carey school? The Carey School. I had a very liberal outlook from my birth, I would say. Good. And I went to uh, Georgetown Law School also. Down in Washington. Washington. Um, I wondered if your uh, father had um, suggested that you go in the law. Had he hopes for, had, the, had your parents hopes that you'd go in the law? I don't think so. And no one in the family had ever been? No one in the family, no. No lawyers in my family that I know of. What made you decide to do it? I don't know. I had some other family influences from an uncle and an aunt, and I guess that uh, my college uh, inclinations were to carry on like that. When you went off to Holy Cross, you did not think about that at first? I don't think I was thinking of uh, law school at that particular time, no. I don't know how many uh, of <coughs> your generation went off to uh, uh, college from Newport in, in 19... It would have been 1939 that I graduated from uh, uh, from college, so I went to law, I went to college in 1935, the year I graduated from De La Salle. And in 39 there was a little bit of sort of wondering about war or didn't, didn't uh, affect not, that not going in, in? Not in the United States, I don't think. People were thinking about war at that time. Yeah. Um, did you have any kind of um, fun life uh, out in the street, Bateman Street? We're trying to find out how children grew up uh, in their childhoods as opposed to previous or future ones. Well, I would say that the most uh, fun life, as children know it, uh, existed in the uh, in Morton Park, which was a just one big playground for uh, tree climbing and uh, and all sorts of uh, games of uh, that kids play and uh, building tree houses and making forts in uh, uh, some cavernous rocks and also. The, uh, right next to Morton Park was a quarry that had uh, considerable space to play in, including a pond that the kids always used to play well, in. Well, you weren't supposed to be playing in the quarry. Probably not. And the quarry was uh, uh, another playground. And then, of course, what is now uh, the uh, uh, play field, the tennis courts down at the corner of Carroll Avenue, which was then called the Richmond lot was another source of, uh, of uh, playground for the kids. And one uh, right outside my house, Bateman Avenue, was always a favorite sledding um, location for many people throughout the whole city of Newport. It was rather a well-known uh, hill for safe and uh, fine sledding. Why was it safe? Didn't it go straight into well, Town Street? It went, no, it went straight. Uh, straight into um, what is the corner of uh, 
Carroll Avenue. Uh, it's the intersection of Carroll Avenue, Bateman Avenue, and, and, and it's right at the practically at St. Augustine's Church. It did, but the uh, it doesn't sound time, it doesn't sound like it's very safe it, right now. Well, no, it's probably not safe right now. But the automobiles were few and far between, and uh, I guess that they were they even blocked the street off for sledding. Well, I guess actually when there was enough snow to sled, I guess the cars weren't weren't using weren't, it. Uh, they weren't very much in evidence. Though. The the, chain, the chains clack, yeah. clack, clacking. Um, were there any particular kinds of uh, games uh, in the park that you uh, did you ever get together with team sports? Well, there was always uh, kids football and kids baseball, and there was a, a game called Lee Storks, which I I couldn't describe, but just about uh, going off and hiding a team going off and hiding throughout the park and another team going off to either capture them or, 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 or find them and without their being able to come and run through a goal which would free all the people who were had been captured and in, in, in the goal. And it was the idea was to capture everybody. That was probably the most um, widely accepted and uh, widely the sport most widely participated in, other than the uh, regular games of football and baseball. Uh, you d didn't. You did not have any playgrounds at uh, was, John Clark. No, just enough. This was just. Uh, this was in the Morton Park. Well, I did, but I was think. I was at thinking. John Clark, the uh, uh, playground was, was just not, as it is now. The, the, just a yard, the school, school the yard. Yeah, yeah. Um, these were these were all boy games. No, no girls allowed in these. Not, not, not then. Often. Not, 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 many not girls. for that while. Not many girls. No. Of those people that you played with, then do you keep up with them at all as the years have gone on? Have well, you outgrown would, them? Uh, Are no, they? I, I would say that uh, I am still. Uh, friendly and uh, know of the majority of people in, uh, that uh, were there then and that are, there, that are there now. Now I didn't find out where you are living now. I live now at 23 Halliden Avenue which is still the same uh, general, area. general area except a little bit. Uh, well I spent the uh, years from my birth to approximately 1920 Nine or thirty at Bateman Avenue, and then from 1930 till 19, 19 till I came home from World War II, and a little after at 565 Spring Street, which is the corner of Spring and Cary. So they're not very far apart, but no, how is the furthest that you've gone now in, right, in, right, in your right. grown? Right. Yes, years, yes. married years. Only in the last five years. Oh, just years. the last five years. Five or six. Or five. So you were staying on Spring Street all all your uh, all these last. I bought. 15, I bought. Years. I bought Spring Street from my mother in about nineteen fifty, maybe fifty one or two, and lived there uh, with my children. Grew up there. And that was up at the corner of Cary. Cary, right. I'm I'm a little vague about those those uh, those streets that come that come down there, but I, the number well, five hundred is quite far south. It's well, um, Narragansett is the big landmark, and uh, Cary is one south of Narragansett, one south, okay. and one north of Webster, two north of Morton Avenue. When you were playing in Morton Park, I suppose you had no idea who had made that park out for the city. Um, At that time. No, I did not. No. You know now. I know that. Yes, I. Mr. Olmstead. He's very lucky that he did as right. much as he did for Newport. But the park is not in very good condition at this point. Well, it's know? surprisingly um, spruced up right at this moment. I would is say. it? Yes, but I'm 
sorry to say that I see cars sneaking in there to park when they are having parties on weekends, but generally speaking, it's in fairly good shape. Much trash, uh, no, bottles no, and that, cans no. and things they thrown have out. Been people, they have had a, had a uh, caretaker, a summer caretaker for the last several years, this, to the best of my knowledge. And the city does that? Yes. It's, it sounds very nice. It's a, it's a gorgeous park. It's too bad it isn't the... Uh, there was a time it, that it wasn't it safe, wasn't it? It could be a gem. It? There were some beautiful trees, and uh, and it's really some uh, nice place to picnic, and most people never see some of the uh, uh, rear or some of the, some of the most southern part of the higher part of the park. Well, now, what and happened to the quarry? The quarry is uh, just about filled in and uh, I think they're almost ready to have some residences built in there. I have some vi vivid, uh, vivid recollections of the quarry uh, because the house uh, at 22 Bateman Avenue was a stone's throw away or even less than a stone's throw and uh, I can remember the uh, crushing of the stone and the blasting of the uh, rock and uh, the people who owned the quarry and the people who worked there and the uh, one of the owners who was quite friendly with my mother and father uh, whose name was Tim Sullivan would come and tell us that he would be blasting in a half an hour and we should take whatever precautions we did. I don't know whether what it was. I don't think we were hiding, but I guess you were just uh, supposed to brace yourself for the blast, and uh, I don't remember any, any uh, at the house ever shaking or anything like that. But I can remember the blasting. And, uh, well, now that wasn't the famous Tim Sullivan. No, no, no. This is another Tim no, Sullivan. No, but I remember Timmy Sullivan vividly too, because he would walk by my house on his way to some of his peregrinations, either to the Newport Country Club or to wherever on his quest to uh, seek wood and he was quite a also he was a golf ball hunter of some note and he was uh, he was a very very articulate man who I you know, who was really I guess self-educated mostly by reading the New York Times as I recall and I can remember how how extremely I don't know whether you call him eloquent, but he was certainly uh, had a great command of the English language, and, and I always considered him a quite a good friend of my family. I'm sure he was a good friend of my father, who grew up close to him. Uh, how how much of that eccentricity? Now this is the woodhooker. That's Timmy the woodhooker. Woodhooker. Hooker, hooker. Because I remember as a child going down Bellevue and being shown that, and I was thinking at that childish time that, that he and the woman that I know was, that his, was sister, his sister, Julia, Julia uh, I thought that they were living there in the... They did. Well, aren't they also, they also supposed to be down they also in Wellington? They also had some uh, connection and uh, there was a little store that was at the corner of Thames and Wellington uh, and I think that it may have been uh, a little tiny Rinky Dink candy store and maybe paper stores store, and I think that Julia uh, was the one she, who took care of that store. And there may have been some living facility that they had in the rear of the store or close by the rear of the store, which was their dwelling prior to their going to the location at Bellevue Avenue. One of my narrators told me of his experiences selling his bound golf balls to Julia. Mm -hmm. uh, and they made quite a thing of it because they did not give as much, I think it was 15 cents for a whole, a whole lot. And uh, uh, this boy Probably had to go that. home and had to give the 15 cents to his mother and she gave him 10 cents back and he went to the movies. 
This was Saturday. The big, the big thing on Saturday. That was much before your time, though. This was uh, someone uh, 20 years, 15, 20 years older. Well, I, I, I would say that I knew uh, Timmy Sullivan very well. And I'm, I th I'm, I'm sure my mother or my father told me that he was one of the first people to come in and see me as a baby. Really you don't really know his background then, whether he had some education or whether it was all self-taught. I, I think that he was probably grammar school educated, and other than that, uh, his own reading ability must have been uh, quite. He must have been a serious reader. That's what I always understood. But he owned that land on Bellevue Avenue. Yes. And he held out for it, didn't he, uh, a long I time? I think that uh, it was finally purchased by Mrs. Van Rensselaer, one of his neighbors or somebody else. Uh, there's a whole, um, there's a whole uh, legal uh, rigmarole about the purchase and sale of his property. Getting uh, him out. Yeah. I didn't know whether it was after he, he may, died or not. I, I, I don't remember. I think that all that, uh, there, it, there's either a record of that in the probate court or the well, it was it was it was always that was something that happened when I was uh, maybe after college or at, at college time, and I wasn't paying much attention, yeah. to, or even when I was first in practicing law, and I wasn't paying much attention to that. But I mean, that should be a matter of record. Oh, I think that uh, that definitely uh, it would make a lovely story, and, and I've never heard of anyone who knew them. So it's great that you. Uh, Coming on the on my the mother would tape tell you some, some, some probably vivid stories about Julia and Timmy. I, I I never I've got any idea about her at all. Well, I can remember Julia, yeah. Untidy. Very. Yes. Well, I guess then I did see her working up there in all the wood and the, right, and the refuse right. and she stuff. Was always dressed in very uh, much uh, dark clothes and probably black clothes. Too. Do you have any other eccentrics of your neighborhood you can think about that would be fun to, for the archives no. to, to look at a uh, hundred years from no, now when they're looking over these? eccentrics I can remember. Some eccentrics that uh, I remember from the summer colony. Well, we're going to we're going to we're going to give you a chance if you want if you want to tell if you want to tell about that. Um, We've, uh, we've covered your education, I think, as fully as we need to. And uh, as far as the religious part of the education, I can imagine what that was like. How about religion in the home? Was that very strict? Reasonably strict, I think. Everybody went to uh, uh, most, all of my uh, brothers and sisters, my sisters and brother went to... Uh, and to public grammar school and all went to Catholic instructions and church and on Sundays. And you were the only one that went through the parochial school system then? I didn't go through the parochial school system. I went to, um, to um, I, I think I was in, in St. Mary's for um, uh, either um, uh, a a kindergarten or a first grade, and then I went to Cary School for for my grammar school and John Clark for my John Clark was 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 the public school public system school, then. Yeah, and then De La Salle. Oh, which well, was the only. Well, I I don't know why uh, John John Clark belongs to the Catholic Church now. John Clark, no. Has John it, Clark isn't that there on John Mary Clark, Street? Yeah, John Clark is now. Uh, the, um, I thought it uh, belonged to St. Joseph's Parish, along in there. No, you're thinking of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the old uh, church that's on Clark Street, mm -hmm. I think, which was owned by the, uh, by St. Joseph's yeah. Church, and now I think the state has it for a museum. Or well, then I thought it's next it to the artillery. That yes. the John Clark School is now the uh, part of the administration. Uh, oh, uh, offices I, of the of the city of Newport School. Oh, well, I, 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 I'm so glad we got that straightened out. In my mind, it's, it's all right on the tape, but I that I I, I didn't understand that. 
Because De La Salle, John I know, Clark, was great. John Clark had eighth grade in, at, uh, at, as a main function, eighth grade for the almost the largest part of the city, maybe the whole city, which was just prior to high school. And the other schools throughout the city had grades kindergarten through seven. Oh, they, so so when you were growing up, it's just that one eighth, eighth grade. grade there. I think that was the only eighth grade mm -hmm. in the city for all for all the city. So that everyone had to go either to Rogers they or made, to De La Salle. Uh, but your time was at St. Catharines. St. Catharines was after. I think there there was a St. Joseph's school which had a Catholic high school. I think for girls maybe. Uh, when I have. Uh, uh, asked of this religious thing about the, how does a family spend the Sabbath. Of course, <laughs> there's a great difference between the Calvinist Sabbath and the Roman Catholic no. Sabbath. Uh, did you, was, was Sunday a particularly different day except that you had to go to church? Church, no, I would say no. You could play the same games and yeah, everything. I had, I had no you could dance, like you could dance if you wanted if to. wanted to, yes. No. Uh, were there any special uh, holiday observances in your home? I don't think that's particularly interesting, unless you had some kind of festivities. Did, no, was, really. was, was Christmas a real Christmas, big thing? Christmas was big, yeah. Was Easter more Easter than a new also, suit? Yes, right. Just a new suit? Religiously, I would say. Religiously yeah, it was, right, yeah. was big. Mm -hmm. uh, on Bateman Street, uh, Bateman, Avenue. Bateman Avenue, I'm sorry, uh, to get back to your uh, parents' generation, were, was there friendliness there on, on the street, neighborhood uh, friendliness? Very much so, yes. That's what we really want to, to establish, that neighbors did talk to and knew each other. Maybe not so much going back and forth in their homes, but friendly on the outside. Very much, yes. Everybody knew. I think uh, everyone knew uh, everyone uh, the whole length of the street, which was from um, the foot uh, of the West End uh, at Carroll Avenue to the top of the street, which was up at Cockshill Avenue, which was almost, uh, say, at least an eighth of a mile and maybe a quarter of a mile. And that was both sides of the street? Both sides of the street. But it wasn't, it was only sp sparsely populated because one side, um, one side, the southerly side of the street had a large estate, which is now uh, Newport Manor or some such thing that you probably see regularly in the middle by. Now, is that anywhere near the quarry part that you're going to tell me to is quarry. going to be built again? Do you think it'll be another Newport Manor kind of? Oh, no. No, I'm talking that the quarry may be several uh, uh, private residences. Oh. Not not any no, more no, housing. Not any housing development. No. Um, I think we'll go on now. Where did this will be your your uh, your family? Where did you meet your wife to be? Newport. And uh, where did um, you first live? First live mm -hmm. as a married together, yes, and uh, uh, autonomy. Uh, did you have any children born there? No. So you didn't stay very long. Not long, no. <laughs> no. Uh, and it was then that you bought your grandmother's. No. No. Uh, then I. Uh, well, you didn't tell me what year you were married. I was married in 1947. All right, so you had been uh, been in service. I had just come, back. come we're, home one year from... We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so, um, you had not started to practice the law before you went in the service. I... I had uh, not practiced, but I had passed the bar, passed the bar in Washington, D.C., right after law school, and I was admitted to the bar in Washington, D.C., and went immediately, no, that would have been probably sometime in June of 1942, and, 
and uh, when I went uh, to the service in November of 1942, or late before, before ever taking the Rhode Island bar. But, uh, but we'll, we'll, come, we'll okay. come, to, come to that, uh, come to that yes. later. Uh, you about your children, um, when they were born, uh, did, did, uh, was Dr. Sullivan still no. around? Dr. Zelensky. And uh, we didn't establish how many you had, how many children you had. Four boys and one girl. All living? Yes. I was asking you <coughs> about the four boys and one girl. You told me earlier that one child uh, lived at home. Which one is that? Daughter, Ellen. Lives at home. And the boys, I think you should be very proud of, of some of them I know about. I don't know about all of them. Um, let's let's uh, quickly go over the, what, the, what the boys are doing now. Oldest son, Patrick, is practicing law with me. Next uh, oldest is Michael, who has a, a haberdashery uh, under his own name on Bellevue Avenue. Next son is Christopher, who is employed at the Narragansett Clothing. And the next son is Peter, who is employed by KSH and True, True uh, some uh, hardware company at, uh, what's the name? Well, not True Temple, but some similar name. And uh, Ellen is at home. Uh, so the, the, is the is the hardware employed boy in town? He's in Middletown, living so, in Newport, but working in Middletown. So you've got Quiddick Avenue. All your children. Right nearby. Right nearby. That doesn't happen all the time. Um, did your children start that? childhood more or less the way you started yours, do you think the the backgrounds were the same? You didn't tell me after you left Tonomy where, the, where you came. Well, I went to live on Lee Avenue, to the best of my recollection, and for a short period of time, and uh, uh, I bought a home there in back of my O'Neill family, uh, part of the family uh, from my aunt, in back of the funeral home uh, down the avenue. I lived there and uh, lived on the second floor and had a couple of uh, rentals while maybe a couple of children were born. And soon after that, I uh, bought the house on Spring Street. So it really was a, a quite a family enclave. Uh, you haven't told me about the O'Neill part of your family, and I suppose before we go off to uh, some other subjects, maybe we better do about that, because we don't usually ask about grandparents, but I think in this case, so much of Newport history depends upon that. Would you like to tell me about them? Well, I don't remember. I, all I know is my grandfather, O'Neill, was the funeral director uh, and was Patrick H. O'Neill, and uh, for whom I guess I was named, and he was my father's, he was my mother's father, and he had uh, several daughters who mostly lived at home with him in, at the location of the funeral home. And although I know I have pictures of his taking me in a, one of the old uh, Cadillac touring cars, maybe around Ocean Drive, I don't remember him. I can't, I can't say that I remember him or my grandmother or him. I think Bill can remember he your would. grandfather. I'm sure Bill yeah. would as mm -hmm. banker. Yeah. And then you have... I'm sure that... He was uh, rather a well-known personality in the, in the community, especially in the Fifth Ward area. And the uh, the business is still in the family, in it's, uh, part uh, of the owned family. It's owned by my uh, brother, 
now who is about to transfer it to one of his sons. So that will be four, four generations. One. You know. No. No, my uh, grandfather uh, operated it, and, and then after that, a uh, husband of one of the grandfather's children. Yeah. Joseph A. Nolan. Yeah. Was the uh, operator of it. But it's still it's still all it was, the same it was still, family. The still family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you had these children. Uh, I don't. Did they come one right after the other fast? Uh, yeah. The the five children. Quite. Quite. Uh, so I don't have to ask whether your wife worked outside the home. She didn't. And um, who disciplined the children? Both of us, I guess. Uh, were they free to play with anyone they chose? Oh, yes, definitely. Did they have anywhere near the same kind of uh, childhood that you had had? <clears throat> I think that the uh, kids that were growing up with mine were, were getting into the organized children's activities that were either church sponsored or school sponsored or sponsored by uh, family uh, over, uh, or groups that were overseen by parents. More than, uh, I think it's called structured. You just didn't go out, didn't go out and play in the streets it anymore. It was more structured, yes, but not completely. Uh, I don't think probably, as time goes on, their memories of their childhood are going to be quite as vivid as those of you who went out and played your own games and made your own fun. Probably not, no, I don't think not. I didn't find out, uh, Pat, about your interest in uh, uh, golf uh, growing up with a father. Uh, who not only could make the clubs, could teach, could run a shop. Uh, when did you start to be interested in golf? I imagine I started as soon as I was, um, you know, a little after being able to toddle around, maybe four or five, I would have had probably a golf club, and certainly six and seven, and uh, grew up with it. And I spent, you know, mostly all my young childhood some summer life at the Newport Country Club with my father, either working for him, caddying, or playing, or, or uh, I also worked as a uh, caddy master, and I made also made golf clubs and repaired golf clubs myself. It was a real it part was, of, you know, of, of your I, life as well right, as his. I made golf clubs with iron heads and wooden shafts that were then, uh, you know, in vogue until the uh, middle 30s when the steel shaft clubs came out, probably about that time. Well, now, when you're talking about making uh, golf, uh, you, didn't, you didn't make the irons. No, I didn't forge the irons. The irons came uh, with heads separated from a shaft, and the shaft was raw and uh, raw hickory and it was sanded and smooth and stained. And, and wasn't it bound? It seems to me I can remember. Didn't it have binding? It, well, it had no... It string, had, string binding? It had only string binding to hold the um, leather grip in place. Oh, not down, not down Sometimes the it had binding in other locations for decorative purposes, but um, a wooden shafted golf, I mean wooden head, Golf clubs were bound uh, at the where they where the shaft fitted into the neck of the wooden. I thought head, I had remembered they, something like that. And they were uh, that was uh, for strengthening purposes, I believe. Well, now you also uh, got the driver. Uh, I didn't ever make wooden clubs. No, but I can remember my father doing that. No, but but I mean the heads. You didn't make the head. Your, your father uh, didn't make were, the heads. They would be manufactured. They were man manufactured, but they were uh, uh, stained and, uh, and some shaping was done to them to fit them into the uh, fit to to uh, smooth the shank of the 
of the wooden head up to the fitting of the wooden shaft and of the wooden shaft. Well, Pat, tell me the difference between the people who wanted handmade Wanamaker or Hayes well, uh, clubs as opposed to those who could go to Spalding and get one. Well, uh, there weren't any such thing as uh, Spalding, the, the first matched set of Spalding golf clubs, I think, if I remember correctly, would have come with wooden shafts in uh, the late 20s. And people who could afford such clubs would, you know, would buy uh, a matched set of wooden, of uh, wooden shafted iron clubs. And uh, very soon thereafter, the uh, steel shaft uh, clubs came, and then the, with the name Bobby Jones was the big Spalding name, and uh, they came, uh, I would say, in the late 30s, or early 30s, rather. Now, does anyone use a wooden uh, shaft anymore? Um, I very seldom um, would you see anybody using a wooden shafted club excepting for a fancy putter, but not for, uh, not the for, strength uh, ones. not for uh, hitting iron, hitting, not for the hitting clubs, no. They have exhibitions sometimes when they, somebody like Sam Snead would come here and, and do that for publicity purposes only. How much improvement uh, do you think over the years, as, as you have seen, the clubs that you buy now, uh, are they very much more sophisticated? Oh, much, yes. The, uh, sh the uh, angles of, of the well, not pick so, up the ones? Angles are, the angles are pretty much uh, the same, but the, uh, the manufacturing <clears throat> techniques and the, uh, and, well, so they all have selling features of the sole or the flange of the sole is is devised this way for easier hitting and so forth, and the, sh the uh, shapes are very fancy with all sorts of selling points as to how well you can use them, but the, uh, they are, they're more sophisticated, that's for sure, and I don't know how to explain them other than that. Do people play a better game? now than they used to. Bill and I were discussing tennis, whether these young people today are playing finer tennis than 30 years ago. Are the golfers, do you think, doing better than the Bobby Jones and I, the early ones? I would ones? say that <clears throat> if Bobby Jones were playing in this era, that he would have been, uh, that with the uh, sophisticated improvements in equipment and balls that he would be playing as do all the first flight golfers now. And there were others besides Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones probably is one big stand up, but there were all the other professionals of his era. Bobby Jones was never a professional. And uh, Walter Hagen and uh, men of that era whose names I could recite to you if I had to, but they would all be uh, equally as good as they are today. There's so many other sports that, that uh, each time that we hear about a runner who breaks a world record and we hear about a swimmer who breaks a world's record, there's no possible way of, of taking this individual sport thing and finding out whether they're better after 20, well, 30 years. Well, I think that one of the things that has inspired, um, you know, the, the, the local, uh, the, the, the present day athletes to be better maybe is the presence of a lot of money that is, uh, that is usually the prize for athletic, uh, professional athletes and they spend a great deal more time of perfecting their abilities in order to be the winner of the large sum of money than it was when amateurs were playing it uh, more for the fun and prestige. I think it's terrible that all sports have gotten now to that well, money grind. 
I'm going to let you go now. Okay. Will you um, tell me if you have any memories, of particularly of uh, those who were playing there uh, at the country club, uh, either the golfers uh, that came to play in the tournaments or some of the, maybe some of the characters that you caddied for or worked with? Well, I think that one of the most uh, interesting features of golf in the late 20s was the Gold Mashi tournament that was conducted at the Ocean Links Golf Club, which was owned by uh, one of Newport's summer colonists named T. Suffren Taylor. And it was adjacent to the Newport Country Club. It was lying uh, west of the Country Club uh, 18 holes, and it was uh, uh, quite a delightful nine-hole course. It was designed with uh, particular famous golf holes all over the world in mind, and uh, each of the nine holes was depicting, was, was modeled after uh, one of such famous holes. And e each summer, Mr. Taylor would invite uh, many of the best amateur golfers in the country at that time uh, to participate, and they all came for uh, three or four days, maybe five days, and uh, and it was the, the almost the highlight of the golfing life or the golfing scene in Newport and almost in the state, you might say, uh, for. 10 or 15 years, and I can remember such names as George Von Elm, who won it once, and Jess Sweetser, who was a, a, one of the more famous amateurs of the United States at the time, uh, D. Clark Corcoran, Jess Guilford, who was a Bostonian, Francis Wemet came once or twice. Bobby Jones was supposed to have come, but he never did. And uh, of course, uh, T. Suffren Taylor's son, Tommy Taylor, who died recently, uh, was uh, playing in the tournament, but he had uh, not attained uh, a very, he was a young, very young boy at that time, and uh, he really didn't show forth as the great golfer that he became uh, during the Gold Mashie tournaments. And uh, Watts Gunn, well, there were many uh, of the then famous amateur golfers who participated. And I can remember uh, the Model T uh, Fords, and I think, I don't ever think that the Model A Fords came out at that time, or the fancy Duesenbergs and uh, Ferraris and what have you of the summer colony. Uh, being parked in the area, and all the uh, local sports enthusiasts and uh, enthusiasts coming uh, as spectators for that tournament, and uh, it was a real significant event. Uh, did you ever participate personally no, I in, did not. in any of those? Uh, what have you participated in? Not in in Mr. Taylor's course, uh, but in the country club now. Well, in the country club now, I've played in lots of events uh, over there. But, uh, Do they have anything that brings the same kind of crowd? Well, uh, at about the same time, the Newport Country Club, well, of course, the Newport Country Club had the distinction of having uh, the first uh, open uh, tournament uh, that was conducted in 1894 or 1895 and there's uh, lots of history written about that. Uh, that was a historical event, but um, in the... I think there should be a um, cent centenary about that very soon. Probably. As the tennis people have gotten the, theirs they, in. They, they, uh, I think that uh, the recent tournament that was sponsored by Golf Digest, which were the first of which took place three or four years ago, was done in conjunction with a tennis tournament 
at the casino for a uh, for one of the landmarks. I guess it was a century, uh, almost a century. At any rate, the uh, country club itself had an invitation tournament, and there were uh, some very uh, Cyril Talley, who was one of uh, England's best amateur uh, tourist came, and I think he may have won it once, and I think that Tommy Taylor, whose name I just mentioned as being the son of T. Suffren uh, Taylor, won it uh, many times, and uh, John P. Burke, who was Newport's most famous golfer uh, and had an untimely death in World War II, uh, participated and won it once or twice. And, um, now, what relation is he to the Burke that is he now is the, He is the alive. twin brother of Joseph Burke, who is now the professional at Newport Country Club. And he was a super athlete, both as a golfer and a basketball player, and uh, would have had a, he had a distinguished career as a golfer in the state, and winning the um, state amateur title many times, and I think he was into collegiate champion uh, once and uh, he had a fine career and would have had more of what for his uh, death in the war. Um, what has happened to the area of those nine holes? It, um, it, uh, it uh, remained a golf course till about 1937 or maybe as late as 1940, and um, it was, uh, there were attempts to keep it going by private individuals. I think that Mr. Taylor once offered it as a gift to the Newport Country Club, but they declined to ex accept it, thinking that it would have been too much of a, uh, of a struggle financially to keep it up, and that was, is now probably proving to be a mistake, but uh, now, Part of it is owned by the state of Rhode Island open space land, uh, and uh, some of it has been developed in house lots. Uh, most of it is open, or the Rhode Island uh, open spaces. Does that uh, in any way become adjacent? It wouldn't to the Brenton Point. It, it part of it, the the course was comprised of three or four four lots which are still, uh, the demarcations of which are still uh, visible, and it was bisected uh, in, in part by the old Budlong estate and by Commonwealth Avenue, I think, is the road that ran through, and uh, uh, there was one lot which was the closest to the Newport Country Club, had the first and the ninth holes, <coughs> excuse me, and the next lot was uh, west of the fifth hole or the seventh hole of the Newport Country Club and in that lot were the second and eighth holes and in a lot that fronted on Ocean Drive which is now part of Brenton Park there was the <clears throat> third and fourth holes and in a lot which is also now uh, fronted on the ocean um, by uh, on the south was the fifth, sixth, and seventh holes, and they're all uh, very. Uh, you can see the. But isn't that great that the state now has got them? I think not as golf holes. No, 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 as, as land. As, as open space, yes. Uh, there's a name for that. That's not. Way, it's not the sea. It's not the seashore, and it's not. Uh, it's not a national thing. I, I, it's it's the state uh, open space. Well, they've uh, done a beautiful it's job. The, it's really the park system. I think they've done a beautiful job it there on Brenton, Brenton Point. Do uh, you think we finished golf and we go on to just for a minute as to what the city's done about uh, uh, letting some uh, restoration go on, or you don't want to talk about restoration and redevelopment? No, that's I, one of our subjects. I. Uh, Uh, first of all, I think I'd rather go back and uh, ask you how you um, 
became interested first in the city political system and then in the state system and go quickly from there as to what your feelings are now about what is happening to Newport. This still ties in. I know you don't like the idea too much, but it still ties in with this boy of uh, Bateman Avenue who is now uh, looking back. Well, I, I don't know what kind of uh, thoughts or what kind of plans or what my ideas were in running for city office. I guess that I felt that I was uh, fortunate to uh, have been uh, educated and uh, able to be have become a lawyer and I thought that there was some duty to, uh, on my part, to give uh, some of my time uh, to the seeing, seeing that the city was uh, being conducted as well as I might help to conduct it politically, and I ran for city council. How many terms did you? I, I had uh, two terms of two years each, uh, so that of of two two year two two year terms, so that I had four years with a, um, a vacation for two, and then four more years. Well, I think that was a very generous I, a total gift of, of time. Eight years, and after that I. Uh, branched out to the state senate and had six years in the state senate. I think it is terribly uh, wrong of the state to expect active young <coughs> congressmen up there to give so much time uh, away from their jobs with so little remuneration. I, I, I really think that's um, a very, very bad uh, situation where it costs some of these people in the assembly too much money to to uh, represent their area if they're not going to get something out of it in the end. Well, I I think that it may be that uh, that the state is skimping on on getting the best talent perhaps in the in the long run by not uh, rewarding or by not compensating people who run for office uh, properly. But uh, uh, on the other hand, there are lots of people who have given uh, uh, enough time and that have had enough talent who have thought that it's a civic duty that they have performed and have uh, performed it well in many instances. And uh, uh, that still seems to be the same uh, same pattern. Well, it is. It is. Uh, if if the person is not going to get something out of it in the end professionally, uh, he certainly is doing a sacrificial job. If he is not being able to do his own business or profession at that for those hours. Well, I'm not so naive to think that as a uh, as a lawyer that you would uh, not think that you were going to be rewarded in some way, and certainly the rewards of uh, having political entrees is some uh, reward, and also uh, the uh, notoriety or the uh, publicity that goes with having your name in the paper as having been Senator this or Senator or Representative that who introduced a rather important bill or took an important stand on a, uh, a bill uh, that was uh, all helpful in one's legal career, as, as, as a lawyer speaking. Yes. Uh, what a businessman uh, uh, in insurance might have the same thoughts, but I'm sure that they were not all selfish thoughts. No. And, and, the, and the man who uh, is running a store that he's not going to get uh, as, uh, as much uh, by the, by the same token, uh, you take a stand or, uh, or introduce a bill, and if you make 50 friends, you might make 50 enemies. So, uh, so <laughs> half and half. Um, Pat, uh, we've got a lot more to cover, and I 
it sounds like we're jumping a lot, but I'm just so afraid that we won't uh, get around to the, the, the things that are different from our uh, schedule here. Um, I asked you off the record about how, why did you get interested in the French language? Why? Mm -hmm. Well, I... Or how? Uh, why and how? Well, I had uh, an aunt who was interested in the French language, and she thought that uh, it would be uh, an addition, uh, an additional asset to my education, I guess, if I learned a little French and I took lessons with the Sisters of the Holy Ghost, uh, or the Daughters of the Holy Ghost, as they may be more <coughs> Were they the Seneca down on Washington Street? They were the Seneca, and they were also at the St. Clair home, which was then uh, a convent and not the St. Clair home as it is now known as a sort of uh, rest home or, or a convalescent home. It was uh, uh, a group of sisters who were mostly engaged in, in uh, public nursing, and they were uh, mostly all French born, that is, uh, 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 European uh, born in, in France, and, uh, and I took some lessons uh, as a young uh, child with them, and uh, I was interested, and then I became uh, interested in it in high school and took all the courses that I could in high school. In college, in French. They, uh, I completed all those, and then uh, I didn't have much occasion to be uh, speak, uh, speaking or studying or conversing in French during the time that I spent in law school, but immediately after law school, I was inducted into the army, and after a short time, I found myself at a military intelligence school in Camp Ritchie, Maryland, at which time I started on a career of being a French interpreter and uh, went overseas on a military intelligence team uh, attached to the 100th Infantry Division, and there, in spite of all the French that I had thought I learned in school and college, I finally got to France and uh, found out that I would soon be able to speak French if I listened to the people in France and, and uh, not emulated them, but uh, tried to um, imitate them, and thereby hangs the tale of my uh, learning to speak French. And I have been interested in the language ever since, and I have clients who speak French. I uh, converse with uh, uh, friends uh, who come back and forth from France. I, I have friends in France with whom I communicate by mostly by letter, and I read uh, Harry Match or Figaro and uh, keep up with it as best I can. And mostly I'm just interested in, in the language. I like languages, especially the Romance languages, which I find a little bit easy. I Are you musical? Not, well, I like... Uh, Have you a good classical ear? Classical Have you a good ear? Yes. I because so. I think... Uh, uh, those who can speak a language easily usually have a musical ear, and those of us that can't learn to speak a language uh, uh, have have problems with uh, with music. Well, I would say that I have a pretty good musical ear. Yes, I can get something out of the French operas or the Italian operas or, or uh, French uh, on French records. I, I didn't mean only in Fran French. I, I meant well, as, I, as music in general. Well, music in general, I, I, I can appreciate it. I, I, like it. I, uh, I think the United States Army was very lucky to have found you. Well, not but really. I bet you were scared when you first heard, <laughs> heard some of those people over there from your lovely schooling French. Well, I wasn't scared, but I uh, realized that uh, 
that this, this, when I heard somebody speaking in French, I uh, realized that, you know, I had to get with it a little more than I, I wasn't as, uh, as quite as able to uh, speak French fluently as I had thought. Because you had been taught beautiful 19th century French, and here was the patois and the idioms that had of, of the 20th century. Well, I wouldn't say, say it was that so much that. It was really just acquiring the facility of speaking it the way a Frenchman did instead of the way an American would do it. And I can tell you very easily how, uh, uh, in just one or two sentences, just exactly what I'm saying, and that is that I might have, when I arrived in France, gone to say, I, in fact I did, I was in a cafe close to Paris, Saint Germain, where we were waiting to go further into the country, and I would say, bonsoir, monsieur et madame. And uh, when I heard a Frenchman, he would say, bonsoir, monsieur et madame. And, uh, and so it's just uh, observation and uh, paying attention and wanting to do it. I, I wanted to do it. That's the main thing. Well, you've got a, a wonderful group of your alliance here, I think, for a very small town. I guess you'd say that. How many do you seem to have now? I was doing a list with uh, um, the uh, Connolly girl, and it seemed to me there was quite a lot. There could be as many as a hundred that are in that film. Some with better French than others. Oh, yes. Uh, it's not quite fair to have <laughs> the French in there along with the poor Americans <laughs> and trying to compete as far as, as accents go. Um, Bill told me that you were very much, or had been very much interested once in the Greek fisherman of Newport. Is he right? Not really. Um, I, I told Bill in his capacity as president of the Historical Society that I thought that there was a big gap in what has been written about the various ethnic groups who comprise the citizenry of Newport, and that in that the, uh, no, nothing had been written about the Greek community. Not so much just the Greek fishermen, but the Greek community as such. And that uh, I had been attempting to do something about it. And I have the star, and I've started and stopped, and, uh, and uh, there is plenty of material available, but, and I've also got some sources of information that I wanted to sit down with the members of the Petropolis family and the Coulibatis family and uh, oh, several others and see if we could put together something about that uh, segment of our community. We have plenty written about the English and the Irish and uh, the uh, French, and uh, the, I think there's a big uh, need for some history about the Greeks. Have you uh, ever thought uh, of doing it on uh, a tape as the uh, as the ideas come to you? I think this tape business should help people very much, uh, if you, especially if you have someone to transcribe what you've said so that you can go over the notes of what you've said, rather than have to put these notes down and get them all I, uh, mixed I, up. I would, uh, that would be, uh, I would think that that would be an easy way to do it, yeah. I was wondering if it could be possible, maybe, to get someone, well, would so Karajanis be a person that could uh, almost uh, talk to you about uh, uh, the, the various things back and, and lead you out? Well, uh, I have uh, several friends in the, in the Greek community who would uh, uh, be able to, to do it. There's no, um, there's no difficulty in finding the sources of the information. They're there. It's just that 
time. It's got to be done and somebody's got to do it. And it's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but there was some, there's also a good uh, start on it because the uh, uh, St. Spiridon's Church had a 50th anniversary, I think, back in the 40s. And uh, some of the history of the community is, would be basically found there. Well, then you're almost getting up to a 75th one. Yeah. Right. Well, that, that, that answers uh, one, of, one of those. Um, I think what I would like to go on to now, uh, I've gotten your war thing, and you were not particularly interested in telling me about your reactions to the Fall River Line being taken out of Newport, or how did the, uh, the Depression uh, didn't affect you as a, as a boy? Did it def affect your family particularly? I don't think so. Uh, it is, it's turning out in, in these interviews uh, that uh, the professional people or the, or the business people that had to keep on going were not hurt. It was the people that lost their jobs that had such a dreadful time. Well, I, I uh, don't know whether I'm completely clear on, on it, but I think that Newport as such was uh, spared uh, some of the real uh, difficult circumstances that most of the country found, found itself in in the Depression. But it didn't have the industry, so it didn't... It was living mostly on, on the... Uh, taking care of the summer trade or the summer colony business. And then, of course, there was always the uh, torpedo station and the Navy base. And I think that as a result of uh, those, those bases of, uh, of not commerce, but uh, of uh, econ economy, uh, that the Newport feared pretty well in the Depression. Certainly there were people that were hurting, but not as, as they weren't as numerous uh, per capita as were somebody uh, outside in the other parts of the state. The, uh, uh, we seem to find out that it really was uh, mostly the Fall River Line uh, closing that the, the shops down there that that hurt uh, a great many people, uh, whereas the uh, professionals didn't um, didn't feel it in in desperation. Uh, you weren't very um, old when prohibition was was put in. Have you any memories at all of the repeal of the 18th Amendment? Vague. I can remember my father making home brew. I can also remember some of the rum running activities around in the city and the um, uh, big uh, rush that there was to uh, find that somebody had just brought a boat into Belmont's Beach down off the cliffs and they had cases of golden wedding that were available if you could get there at the right time. And uh, that's the only kind of liquor that I can remember by name that seemed to be uh, much sought after or much desired during the uh, time when there was prohibition. And uh, you were too young to have it celebrated repeal. I think so. There, uh, we older people have some very nice memories of, of our first legitimate beers. <laughs> what was the date of repeal? Oh, 30, uh, 30, 32, wasn't it? 32, I guess, yes. Oh, I 33. Know. 32 yeah. or 33. Um, where were you when the 1938 hurricane hit Newport? I was on my way to uh, re 
returning to college at Holy Cross. <coughs> You had started out that afternoon. I, was, I got there. How did Worcester fare? Well, the only thing that I can remember was uh, looking out and seeing uh, a very uh, famous landmark in Worcester, which was close to the uh, college, and it was called the Fitzwell Girdle Company, and I can remember the roof of that. Uh, factory raising up and down. But Just flapping in the wind? Well, it wasn't flapping, but it was visibly uh, moving up and down. Uh, when did you know it was a hurricane? Well, what time had you left Newport, can you remember? Well, I don't remember. Whether it was the morning I mean, before I the was, trees had fallen, no. you didn't have any trouble. You were driving. I had no problem. Were you driving? I was being taken by my aunt, who was who returned to Newport and had to spend the night, I think, in the Stonebridge Inn on her way back. Wasn't able to get It must have Newport. been a terrifying return for her. I think so. Well, Is she still living? No. Uh, you mentioned uh, your mother uh, would have been uh, able to. Is your mother still living? Yeah. What was it that you mentioned that uh, she, she would be? Oh, it was about Julia. About Julia and Timmy. You think she would? Oh, well, I can speak to her. I think it would be great mm -hmm. fun. Also, uh, going back to uh, yesterday, you said that you had uh, a picture of your grandfather taking you maybe around the drive in a big, uh, maybe a Cadillac touring car. If you would let uh, the, if you could find that picture and see if the Historic Society would like to copy it, because they are uh, copying uh, quite a number of memorabilia of these various, I don't know whether they're going to go in the archives with the person, with the person or not. Um, did the uh, Newport Ferry uh, stopping and the bridge going change your life at all? I don't think so. When the Navy fleet departed, did it change your life very the Navy much? Navy fleet and, and what? This, this last uh, departure. I, I don't think so. You didn't have properties on, you didn't no. have saloons down on Thames Street that failed. No, I, I think that the recovery from that departure was, uh, was not too difficult. I don't think so either, and I think that people have forgotten how tremendous the schools are now and how much uh, permanent uh, kinds of people rather than the transients uh, are here. Uh, about the redevelopment and the restoration, um, do you have any feelings about the way our city can or cannot control some of the overbuilding? Well. I think that's simple, that the uh, zoning uh, restrictions have to be strict and they have to be adhered to, and uh, the zoning restrictions uh, were not strict, and, uh, and in many instances uh, were not uh, those which uh, were strict. Uh, Variances were granted, and the restrictions uh, don't seem to be in the right direction. Well, the restrictions have, uh, have now been tightened up in the last uh, several months. That is, as far as so far, insofar as the waterfront is concerned, and that is uh, the biggest concern of, of most people in the in the city. And uh, maybe now uh, that the horse is out of the barn, uh, there won't be any more of the uh, developments that... There's no more land to develop. Well, well the, it seems that it's... It, 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 it's, it, it seems there that there isn't any more to develop, but you'd be surprised when you look around that there is. There is more land to develop, and it should be uh, done. You mean down on the waterfront? All, all, all over the, oh, yes, on the waterfront. In spite of uh, 
what you think if you uh, traverse uh, the, uh, the length of Thames Street, there are more wharfs that uh, have some very desirable spots. But now the uh, the type of buildings that have been permitted to be constructed are prohibited uh, by this late, the latest latest uh, well, that is they are prohibited to be constructed in such sizes and in, with such density. Still, the uh, Wellington with Avenue, uh, the the gas work property there has still not been uh, stopped. That hasn't been stopped because it was done before. Done before they had permits before the uh, zoning change. Uh, some one of my interviewees said that there's going to be problem down there with all that uh, sludge that is developed for years and years if they don't get it out. I uh, imagine that there has been professional uh, uh, Geological. investigation into that and that uh, it's not so. problems like that seem to be corrected very easily. I, I don't expect that there will be any anything that's going to pro prohibit uh, the use or that's going to detract from the use because of such a problem if it does exist. I take uh, people uh, on walking tours or on uh, a few times have been asked to take groups around the, the drive in their uh, buses and uh, it's amazing how many times a question will come up, don't you have any zoning restrictions? And it's a very embarrassing thing as a loyal Newport <laughs> to say they come too late and they come after the fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, it's, it, it's pretty shocking to look at some of the things that have been, have been allowed. I'm just wondering what's going to happen to the economy, whether it's going to get to a point where the people are not going to be af able to afford these great time-sharing uh, places that well, are so expensive. There's that, and also it could develop that uh, the whole area or the whole city could, Excuse me. could really be choking itself to death with congestion. And it's happened in other communities, and you uh, hate to th think that it could happen here, but it can happen here. Very definitely can happen here. And uh, I think that uh, Newport is fast uh, surpassing Hyannis and Provincetown, which I think are almost choked to death. Uh, the only uh, advantage to Newport th uh, over Provincetown is that uh, uh, we can get off the island three ways now, which Provincetown, it, it get up there in that bottleneck and, and... You have to go down and come back. I hope that um, we will stay <coughs> on a little bit... Uh, more elegant level, and I, I think that maybe uh, we won't get it quite. I think it's, too good, it's going to be too expensive here for the uh, Provincetown uh, people to come and uh, try to spend a night. They've got to leave. I hope. Um, Pat, tell me now what you would like to reminisce about of the Fifth Ward that we haven't covered at all. We did cover uh, basically how um, in your boyhood you played uh, in Morton Park. Um, did you have jobs that uh, were the least bit interesting as uh, a young I, lad? I, I caddied and worked at the country club all. all Didn't do newspapers? No. Uh, tell me some I, of I the... Did, one of the other uh, uh, 
locations where the kids in the area used to play was around the lily pond, and there were some trails. The you know, there was a there was a, everybody played cowboys and Indians or some something similar, uh, and uh, there were trails uh, on either side of the lily pond. That is the westerly side and the easterly side, which were referred to as the Kickapoo Trail, and the kids used to get down there, and there was also some uh, swimming uh, done in the uh, area where Mrs. Sheldon Whitehouse's house is now located. It was uh, Bainan's before that, and the kids used to swim there without the benefit of any uh, bathing suits. The, uh, now that was uh, half uh, half salt and half fresh. No, no, it's all fresh. It's all fresh at Lily Pond. It may be a little bit of brackish. salt water get in, but it's not brackish. No, it it is it is all fresh. No tidal. No tidal. No. Well, at all. there's a, a drain, a rather substantial drain, that um, that the overflow from the Lily Pond has that runs into Gooseberry Beach. And it could be that in a hurricane, some uh, uh, or in a, an extremely high tide, that a little uh, salt water would get into the lily pond. Yeah, but, but it's it's not I, brackish. Uh, how about those other ponds all around? Uh, the Almy Pond is the same as the lily pond, but uh, over to the west of the lily pond is the so-called salt marsh, and at Hazard Road, and that is entirely, that's more than brackish, that is mostly salt. Now that that's isn't the salt. Green Bridge. That's the Green, green, green bridge. bridge runs, the water, the seawater runs from Green Bridge, and there is a, a, flat, a flat valve that is sometimes functioning and sometimes not functioning, but the um, dam at Green Bridge, which you can hardly I notice from notice the Ocean there Drive. Well, there is a dam at the, when you go by over Green Bridge. If you look north, there's a dam. Uh, it's a very substantial concrete dam, and it had a flat gate constructed by the city of Newport to keep the salt marsh from flowing back, or to keep the water in the salt marsh and it allowed the seawater to go in so that the salt marsh is is very brackish. It's a, a, a large mixture of salt water. In fact, the vegetation at the marsh indicates the presence of salt water. Now those uh, birds that go from one pond to the other uh, don't seem to care whether they're feeding salt or fresh. No, no the waterfowl don't care much, I guess, that they can find, um, it, it all depends about what kind of waterfowl you're talking about. There are puddle ducks and uh, diving ducks, and they mix it up pretty well, and they, 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 I don't think they have any problems with that. Well, now, did, is that salt marsh area part of the same state uh, no, preservation? No, the salt marsh area, I think, is owned by Mrs. Robert R. Young at this time. The salt marsh area that's on the easterly side of Hazard Road is owned by the Audubon Society. So that is perpetually kept, and and I suppose that uh, Mrs. Young wanted to uh, her estate wanted to do something with it. I guess that the the uh, the state or the coast could st could step in. I think to, they're so afraid of the drainage of the salt marshes. At least they are in James. I guess they are all. They don't want them ever drained. I, I hope not. There's some buildings creeping up close to it. Uh, and they are supposedly on septic ser service, and so we don't know what that what they what no. they drain into. No. Uh, have you been up Green uh, uh, End Avenue lately and seen the building along there? Nine houses, all exactly alike. That pseudo garrison type house, the uh, Portuguese, uh, I imagine, from uh, the beginning of uh, Berkeley Avenue to Indian Avenue is almost filled up now at open land on Green End Avenue. Well, I think I've been on Green End Avenue, but I haven't been. Nine, nine new 
rather rather substantial, typical houses, and a, they'll probably do it across the street, too. We're getting we're uh, just getting too seen it, no. too too many too many uh, too many people and too many buildings for the plumbing. I think of the whole island. We're going to float away very soon. But there is still a lot of land left to to do. Um, how much building has gone around Lily Pond since you played Indians? Oh, lots. The, uh, my partner, Billy Corkin, has a house there. Um, Pat Horgan has a home. There's a home under control. Well, there are numerous homes in the large uh, uh, Idle Hour Farm is there. Is there, is there. And, uh, there, uh, my son has a, uh, my son Michael has a home on a rock down there, it's, it's, and, uh, I Where does the water come from? The drinking water, the, the It's, well, there's a spring, yeah, I, I meant, it's just the natural contour of the land, I, uh, No, I, no, the house water. Oh, oh, the city water. That is city water. Oh, all city water, every place there, yes. That must have been sort of a problem. Well, no, there's water on, uh, on Carroll Avenue, which could service uh, the easterly side of the Lily Pond. There's water in Ruggles Avenue uh, that services the northerly side, and there's water down Hazard Road, which services the west side. We have evidently enough water for all of those oh, people. Yeah. Um, go back now to um, your boyhood area in town and see if there's anything else that has been forgotten. Well, I was going to tell you a little more about the Newport Country Club and I can remember all the wealth that was displayed there and all the uh, so-called pomp and pageantry when I was, uh, say, in high school age, and I can remember uh, persons who came to play golf being chauffeured, and, uh, and the uh, chauffeur dressed in livery and the footman uh, sitting by his side and opening the door for my Mr. and Madame and uh, letting them out at the front door of the country club where they would be greeted by bellhops in uh, handsome blue uh, velvet, not blue velvet, but blue uh, serge, blue, what is the, uh, very fancy uh, dark blue uh, uniforms with brass buttons and uh, and the chauffeur and the footman would take the uh, car down to uh, garage area uh, and wait until they were called back after the golf game for uh, to recover their uh, bosses and their lady and their man and, uh, uh, and the uh, people that came from Bailey's Beach to uh, have uh, uh, tea and cake and the social hour are in the area of 3.30 or 4 o'clock. And uh, 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 that, that's kind of a vivid memory that I have of uh, the ease of life that uh, people had on the summer colony. Now, and when they... We'll go into a great deal of miscellany, and I'll try to uh, ferret out some of the things you haven't haven't told me about. And uh, I know you have been uh, officers on uh, and directors of various uh, societies, such as the 
Historical Society. If you have anything to tell me about um, that or uh, another organization that you volunteered your time to? Well, uh, as far as the Historical Society is concerned, I, uh, I live in, in constant amazement of the abilities of Mrs. Bowhaus, whose talents have been extolled uh, probably uh, She's our city widely. historian no, she's now. She's our city historian, but ever since I uh, have met Mrs. Bowhaus and I've known her family before I knew her, uh, I have had occasion to check into uh, events or places that I wanted some information on. And she's just a source of information that is un unbelievable. And uh, I think that the society couldn't have possibly found somebody who would be so efficient and be such a wealth of knowledge. I can't imagine a historical society in any other community that have, would have anybody comparable to that lady. And uh, the other organization that I had a rather close connection with was what was uh, once called the Newport uh, Public Nurses. I don't know if you think it's now, but the name has changed several times, but I was uh, pleased to have been associated with Helen McLeish and Mrs. Bradley's and several ladies, including my aunt Mary O'Neill Nolan and uh, James Heidler and persons who, whose names I am forgetting only because we're hurrying to get this done, but it was certainly a, an organization that uh, has proven its worth in the city of Newport for lo these many years since maybe back in 1949 or 50 when it was organized. Now we call it the Visiting and Nurse probably, Service. That's probably what I it think, is now. No. And uh, I used to spend a lot of time at that and now I have uh, become a little bit divorced from it. But I still am a great admirer of all that has been done and all the uh, famous ladies who have been the uh, directing force of it, and that is the head nurse or the director, including the present director and her predecessor, Mr. Wire, who was in New Quarter and uh, is not in very good health at the present time. You see, one of the things, uh, Pat, that we are so anxious not in your case with your late birth, but some of these older people that we have lost without getting the reminiscences up. Think what Miss McLeish would have been able to put on tape if she had wanted to, if she had had the opportunity to. And uh, that certainly is a wonder wonderful service. Um, we did. I don't think established when we were talking about the Alliance that you have been the president of it for a, a, a quite a number of years, haven't you? Well, I am the so-called founding president, but there, uh, just as the, uh, the Newport uh, Public Nurses was really founded by other persons, uh, and I had a, 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 a really a peripheral association with it, and I was uh, maybe a figurehead head president, I guess, that I was maybe the same with the Alliance Francaise, where their main, uh, uh, main effort in organizing that was the late uh, Mr. Joseph Dono and his wife Charlotte, and Suzanne O'Bois, and uh, other, uh, Francis Gately, who is now just recently deceased, and other persons, and uh, they needed, I guess, an American 
or a native Newporter who spoke a little French, and I was chosen to be that uh, titular head, I guess, of the organization, even though I did do quite a bit of work um, the, on behalf of that organization, not only then, but still. Well, you certainly helped out one time. I was down there at the Rochambeau Monument, and whatever, I've had a tremendous lot of French, but can't speak a word of it, and I was tongue-tied there with those Frenchmen, and you came and saved the day as far as I was concerned. Suzanne hadn't arrived. <laughs> That was, I don't know, that was during the Rochambeau. Yeah. Are you interested in the Rochambeau Society? No, I have The never. Lafayette Society. No, I have never been uh, close to that at all. Um, you mentioned the uh, community chest. Uh, anything more than the usual uh, no. going out and dunning people? No, but I, I can remember traveling around the state and uh, getting all the pep talks and giving the pep talks and going out and attending the rallies and, uh, uh, and doing my share for that. And, uh, and then suddenly when I was educating kids and, and through college, I was cooled off on that for a while. And, uh, I haven't gotten really back to that again. Um, the, you, you're not particularly much of a tax, uh, you're not what we call a real tax lawyer. I would I, say no. Uh, uh, what, what, uh, what do you call yourself? An estate lawyer? I, I don't know about your trials. I would say a general practitioner. <laughs> I used to do a lot of trial work for my office, but I've been away from that for almost 10 years, and uh, I do a lot of estate work now. But mostly everybody in Newport, I think, is a general practitioner because it's almost impossible to survive being a specialist. Um, come on and, and, and give a little bit more of some of the interest. You, uh, you refinished furniture. What made you decide to refinish furniture? <laughs> I don't know. What, I just was interested in antiques and I had an opportunity to buy. I used to get old pine things and refinish them, which were was a comparatively easy job, and I really have no, I can't bear to see uh, some uh, nice piece of furniture that belongs to, belongs in my own home or in the home of any of my relatives uh, that needs uh, a refinishing. I always take take the job upon myself. I, I just enjoy refinishing furniture. I'm sorry you uh well, I found uh, Mr. Garrett a little uh, tiresome last night. His slides were perfectly lovely. Uh, I didn't uh, say that she found him tiresome. I think you better strike that. All right. And uh, I said that she found the uh, whole program to be a little long. I think she was absolutely right. I'm sorry I misquoted you on oh, that. Okay. Uh, he was beyond some, quite a lot of the people I heard as I was leaving that they thought he'd been a little wordy. I thought his slides were so lovely that it didn't make any difference what he was saying, but we were all getting very tired. It was a long, long meeting. Um, I was supposed to have asked you uh, what your feelings were about the jazz festival, the, the bad one, uh, whether you were there or had any kind of contacts with anybody that had problems with that? Well, I had, uh, I was not there, and I had occasion to be involved in trying to uh, restrain that uh, one, the uh, 
Jazz Festival of one year as a result of the occurrences that had taken place during the prior year, and I think that that's going back to either the late 50s or early 60s, and I can't even remember when, but I can remember... This is the Freebody the Park, Freebody wasn't it? Park. I think it was the early 60s. Freebody Park, I mean, maybe and the neighborhood, uh, uh, the neighbors of Freebody Park came and uh, engaged my office to attempt to uh, restrain that uh, event during one year, and uh, I can remember spending a lot of time in court, and I can remember Chief Radice uh, uh, testifying, and I think that uh, he was opposed to it, and I no, I don't remember just exactly what Chief Radice's testimony, but I can remember that, uh, I can remember interviewing the, the Chief of Police of the State Police Department, Walter Stone, who was still the Chief, and he uh, told us that Newport needed the festival like it needed a hole in the head. I can remember that very vividly having been told to me in his office. I can't remember whether he came down and stated that in court, uh, and it was not a very successful attempt in court, although I guess we did get some restrictions placed on the conduct of the, uh, of the event. It was a, it was a, a very tremendously uh, scary situation. There, that, well, that first I, I just time. don't think that the uh, Freebody Park and the uh, approaches to it uh, were able to handle that, and I think that that was kind of obvious. It's just like if you have uh, something like the Civic Center in Providence uh, and that can handle a large event, it's rather uh, stupid or it's not well thought out to try to uh, tri uh, to import uh, an event that needs the uh, needs a accommodation like the Civic Providence Civic Center and put it into a backyard in Newport. Okay. The uh, uh, Fort Adams now uh, <clears throat> daytime one with no beer allowed. I think it's absolutely fantastic that that. Success. Well, I think that that's rather obvious that uh, that's uh, a completely new ball game and, and is, is working very well, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, did you have a sale? Uh, I'm a once, a once every two year sailor. Well, uh, what interest in the America's Cup, <laughs> having uh, been here and now having gone? I'm interested in America's Cup mostly because of the international notoriety that it brings and also the uh, uh, excellent, uh, well, the, uh, the quality of tourists that it brings and also the uh, income that it brings to the city of Newport, but uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't know the fine points of racing. I don't uh, get too excited about it, except to, to be inter have a reasonable interest. Uh, I hope that the other races that are going to continue will uh, keep Newport in the yachting eye, because I, as you say, it does bring a better quality of, of uh, tourists than, than some of the other, other activities that we have around here. Um, I didn't find out uh, when you came back from World War II, were you around at the uh, D-Day or J-Day? I think that I was in, uh, in Europe uh, still on uh, VJ uh, Day. I haven't left there. 
I can remember where I was on, uh, on uh, when, uh, when the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. Tell me about that. I was at law school. who worked on the Senate police, who were classmates of mine at law school, and I was walking through the Senate office building and the ticket tapes in the Western Union office, which were unmanned because it was Sunday, uh, were, were rattling away uh, with the news of the attack. And, with uh, volumes of, of tape going through the machines. And uh, it really was just uh, registering with us the you know, severity of the matter. And, and, uh, and that's where I happened to be on that day. Uh, you had said once before that uh, in, by 1939, uh, th maybe even uh, 40, uh, you didn't uh, foresee something like Pearl Harbor coming up the, the, the next year. You, uh, you Well, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that the, the average American wasn't looking forward to a worldwide war in 30, or even 39, and uh, and I suppose that if you were a European or an American in Europe, you might have been in on, on all of the intrigue that was taking place and be looking forward to it. Or I guess maybe the, the book Winds of War would be Amateurs' insight into it, and uh, certainly maybe the diplomats and uh, uh, intelligence agencies of the United States would have some insight. But uh, I was the civilians. I don't think mm -hmm. we were, were expecting to be plunged into a war the way we were, and uh, especially uh, into the war in Europe. Um, this uh, summer colony uh, change uh, in the summer colony, but uh, because you were so young, you only knew it uh, really, um, I don't think that you saw its ups and its downs particularly. We know that they don't have the livery coachman anymore. Oh, it's very seldom that you see anybody with a chauffeur anymore. Our uh, United States Senator's wife last night was driving herself alone from the, from the meeting. Sure. Um, then do you think that we have covered these outlines that I was asked to to have you cover, and you would like to so call know, it a day? I think, uh, I, I don't think of anything else. If there is about the Newport Country Club, I might run pen a few uh, notes for you. All right, that's not going to get us on the tape, but uh, no. we can, uh, I could uh, add up, uh, put, put it on myself, but I don't think we're allowed to do that. I think these are absolute sacrosanct and don't, uh, don't get uh, <coughs> touched. All right. Did you remember, you haven't seen your mother, to ask her no, about I Julia? Haven't. Well, that's, that is something that I think would be absolutely fascinating. I think that uh, Mrs. Bowhouse should have, a, have Julia in her, in her wonderful files.
what are we going to do about not having taped Mrs. Bowhouse's remarks all over these last uh, 30 years? The stuff that is lost because think, she rattles on so. I think you could better answer that than I am. It's, it's, it's tragic that we haven't had a tape recorder around her neck year after year. Well, well maybe she can overcome that. I don't think so. It's lost. So, I thank you ever so much. Okay. Let's go. Let's let's find out what you what about well, let, fishing. Let me tell you what I remember about fishing. I can remember um, very vividly the fishing activities that took place at Graves Point, where the same person who owned the Ocean Links Golf Club owned what is was called the uh, fishing club, uh, which was located on, on that uh, point, and it was destroyed during the 38 hurricane, and uh, he had a baiter whose name was Eugene Two, and had, had when you spell two T E W T E W two, and uh, uh, and uh, Gene Two would jump the waters with the Hayden, and uh, he would fish uh, many times himself, and he also uh, caught many striped bass off the uh, piers, uh, the walk piers that were located at Graves Point. There were several located uh, on the Ocean Drive at Brenton's Point and at uh, Graves Point, and there was one at um, the bass stand, which was uh, next to the JT, uh, the, rather the uh, JK Rock, and then there were fishing piers at Price's Neck, and there was some off uh, Stanton's Reef on the on the cliff, and <coughs> uh, Gene Two and his brother George not only baited. Uh, for their own benefit and fish themselves, but they also had uh, visitors from New York who were, I guess, summer colony friends of Mr. Uh, T. Suffren Taylor, and there are photos uh, available in town showing those persons catching tremendously large striped bass and... Uh, from the piers? From the piers, mostly from the piers. And uh, then uh, Gene, too, has a son whom I just discovered by accident when I did some legal work for him. And I had been looking for him uh, several years ago and couldn't find him. And lo and behold, I met him by accident. And, and, and he lives on Annandale Road and is the son of the Gene, too, to whom I just referred. And Gene too, and George too, also had a small fish net, uh, fish uh, net uh, trap business, which they conducted in the neighborhood of uh, Price's Neck, and I think it's called Gold Rock, which is right off the White House property on Price's Neck, and they had another trap over at at. Uh, Raggedy Point, which is the old uh, Agassiz Beach area. And uh, there was not only that fishing activity, um, but also the uh, Tolman and Mac uh, original uh, fishing uh, la fish landings were made right at uh, Green Bridge. Uh, and I can remember Mr. Mendonca, uh, who was the father of uh, George and Manuel Mendonca, who are uh, 
currently involved in Tormund and Mac operation down at Spring Wharf in the city, uh, bringing in the several boats loaded with fish and they would be transported from uh, Ocean Ocean Drive in the Green Bridge area, right next to the house that is now Dr. Carey's. They were unloaded there and uh, the fish brought in town and sold and shipped out of town. That was the days that we could even buy the fish here in town that was fresh instead of having to get it back from Boston. Oh, I think you can get local fish fresh in Newport if you know where to go. However, it is amazing that there is fresh fish in Boston, but not, not in Boston because they unload boats in Boston, but there are, uh, I was in Point Judith, uh, this is not history. Okay. Mr. Hayes was, uh, had to leave at that time, but on his way out the door, he did regret that he hadn't mentioned what pleasure he'd had as a young boy and a young man with his ice skating and his ice hockey teams, but there wasn't time to bring him back to finish up.